I've got another video where I'm going to show you how to answer an interview problem. So this is a problem that comes from TBO's problem solving booklet. So if you're preparing for a maths interview, be it because you've applied for maths or anything similar, so computer science, physics, chemistry, anything that would involve some element of maths in your interviews, this is the series for you. So I'm going to be solving problems, but not just solving them, also explaining what you should be saying if this came up in an interview to maximize your chances of getting an offer. Let's have a look at this problem. The power set is formed from all subsets of a given set. If a set contains n elements, what is the cardinality of its power set? How many subsets contain a given element x1? So let's imagine this question has just been asked to me and I'm the one taking the interview. I'm the interviewee. First thing I want to do is just clarify anything from the problem, if there's anything I've misunderstood. So notice that they've given me a definition here, power set. So a really crucial thing I do is exemplify that I've understood the definition. What's a really good way of ensuring you've understood it is just clarifying it, maybe giving an example here. So I would say to the interviewer something like, okay, so just to make sure I've understood it, everything correctly about this power set it's kind of like the set of subsets so for example if I had a set x which contained let's say 2 3 its power set which maybe I'll denote p of x is going to be a set containing all subsets so like maybe the empty set the set with just 2 in the set with just 3 in and the set with 2 3 in and now that would be me as the interviewee asking a question to the interviewer. And they'd go, yep, that, that's right. Or if, let's say, you've misunderstood it, they'd hopefully then clarify exactly what it is. But the reason you want to do this is so, well, for a few reasons, but basically because you don't want to spend a few minutes answering a question that they haven't asked because they haven't prepared to, uh, they haven't, the interviewers haven't prepared for you to answer some other question. They've prepared for you to answer this specific question. And so if you answer some other problem, they can't really mark you on that. So it's really important to clarify. Also, that's what mathematicians do, right? Mathematicians are super lazy. They don't want to be answer questions that they haven't been asked. So they want to ensure that they've understood the problem correctly. Okay, cool. So I've now clarified, I've understood the terms in the question. Let's continue uh, with this kind of role play. I'll be the interviewee. Okay, cool. So, hmm. My first thought is perhaps maybe what I could do is just test some sets. So I think here it doesn't seem, it seems as if the actual elements in the set do, don't actually matter. It's more to do with which, uh, sorry, the number of elements in the initial set X. So maybe what I could do is play around with some values of N and see if I can spot some pattern. So maybe that's what I'll do. So for example, if I started with x, right, I'll call it x0 if it has zero elements in. So that would just be, well, the empty set. And how many subsets does this have? Well, the only p of x0 here, that would just contain the empty set. The only subset of the empty set is the empty set. And so this would have one element in. Would I be correct in saying that? And then the interviewer would say, yep, that's fine. OK, lovely, cool. So let's look at x1. And x1, so if we have a set with just one element in, let's use the number one, then how many subsets of x1 are there? Well, I could have the empty set. I could also just have the set with one in. And so I get two possible sets. Cool, nice. And if I look at x2, I get, let's say, a set with one and two in. Well, this is a bit like what we had up here when we had two and three in our set, and we got four different subsets. Hmm, one, two, four. It looks as if potentially these could be the powers of two. Obviously, this isn't a proof just yet, but it seems as if that's what these numbers are following. Okay, cool. Now, I can, let, let's maybe test x3 just to see. So if I had one, two, three, and then I'd have the empty set, I'd have all the singletons, so one, two, three, and then all the doubles, so one, two, I'll maybe stop using these curly brackets just for simplicity, two, three, uh, uh, one, three, and then the triple, one, two, three, how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, okay. It does seem to be following this pattern of powers of two. 
But of course, again, this isn't a proof, but maybe there's some reason behind this that I can understand. Why is it that each time it's doubling? Oh, I can see why, and this is actually just one of many reasons that you could explain this with. But I can see, for example, going from x3 to x, so yeah, going from x2 to x3, all I've done is I've introduced the number 3 into uh, the set. So what I could do is any subset that was initially here that was in, in x2. So if, let's say, y is in the set px2, then y will be in the set px3. So for example, up here, we would have had the set 1, 2. And notice that that appears here. So any subset of the set 1, 2 will also be a subset of the set 1, 2, 3. But also, what I could do is take any set in x2 and just shove the number 3 in that set as well. So anything that was in this set, I could just place the number 3 into as well. So if y is in p of x2, then y union x3, uh, sorry, not x3, just 3, will be a member of x3, a uh, member of the power set of x3. And so therefore, and since these are the only ways you can generate elements in x3, we can, and there are no overlaps between these two guys, I can simply add up the number of elements I have in x3, in, in the power set of x3, plus the number of elements I have in x3. And since if we kind of go via an inductive route to try and prove this, if this was 2 squared, then this would be 2 times 2 squared, or 2 squared plus 2 squared, which is 2 times 2 squared, which is 2 cubed. And so by induction, we can prove that each, um, the, the number of elements in the power set is going to be 2 to the power of n. And that answers this part of this question. And the interviewer would say, wonderful, that's amazing, lovely. Let's look now, what if we uh, look at, uh, sorry, what if we ask the question, how many subsets contain a given element x1? Then I could answer something along, along the lines of, well, ah, that's perfect. So let's say we have n elements, let's just for simplicity say 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n as our set. So this is like xn. And we want each, and we only want to consider subsets which let's say contain the element n. So it's something union n. Well, this guy here would have to be then in xn minus 1. And any such set from xn minus 1 would, or sorry, from the power set of xn minus 1 will do. And so therefore, it simply is down to how many sets are there in, X, uh, in the power set of xn minus 1. And using our result from 4, we know that the answer to that is 2 to the n minus 1. Wonderful. And that is how to answer this interview question very, very well. And I'm going to highlight why this was answered really well. Firstly, clarification. If there's anything in the question that could possibly be ambiguous to any extent, clarify it. Make sure you have understood the question properly. That's really important. Secondly, I explained my reasoning very, very well. At the start, I didn't just dive into solving this problem. I explained my thoughts and ideas. So I said, okay, one of the ideas that I have is just to see what happens for small values of n, and hopefully I'll be able to spot some pattern which then I can maybe go on to prove. And then I went on into writing. So it's really, really important that you make it very clear to the interviewer what your thought process is and the direction in which you're heading. Cool. And so I went through the, the maths, I explained it very clearly. I was writing and talking at the same time. And I arrived at this conclusion, 2 to the n. And notice that in the second part of this problem, I referred back to the previous part. So that will generally be the case with a lot of these problems. You've probably done MAT long problems before, or maybe looked at some step long problems as well, where the trick is to kind of, sometimes for the later parts, you've got to use the earlier parts to help you. Sometimes that can be the same kind of idea in an interview as well. So just be mindful of the things that you've already solved in an interview question that can be useful. Now, realistically, this wouldn't be an interview question. It is actually quite straightforward, this question. I've probably made a bit of a mountain out of a molehill here. But the reason I've chosen this problem is because I want to show you the, the things that you should be explaining when answering an interview problem, making it very, very clear. And notice that it doesn't just have to be a response. There were lots of times where I was asking a question back 
to the interviewer as well. It is a discussion. 